In today's show, we're continuing our season previews, talking back up bigs. Is Trenton Watford the solution as a small ball unicorn? And where does Drew Eubanks fit in the puzzle? Welcome to Locked On Blazers. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Trailblazers, your daily Portland Trailblazers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, world? It's your past first point guard and Trailblazers reporter, Mike Richmond. You're listening to another episode of Locked On Blazers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, available wherever you get podcasts and also on YouTube. Thanks for making this show your first listen every day. This is our last week of three days a week, starting next week, starting September 26th. We will be five days a week again, your only daily Trailblazers podcast. So make it a part of your daily routine. Make it your first listen every single day. Today's episode is the sixth installment of the Locked on Blazers countdown to tip-off. We're running down every player on the roster and giving you a brief but thorough look at what they'll bring to the Blazers. We'll look at how they performed last season, how they wound up on the Blazers. We'll talk best and worst case scenarios and we'll finish the program with a discussion of expectations and a likely role they'll play with the Blazers. This is the sixth installment of the countdown. So if you missed the first few episodes... Check your feed wherever you're listening to this, podcast, YouTube, wherever it might be. Today, we're double dipping, talking Trenton Watford and Drew Eubanks. In some ways, these two guys are battling for the same rotation spot as a backup big man off the bench, but they are not at all similar players. Let's start with Trenton Watford who began last season, an undrafted rookie out of Louisiana State University on a two-way deal. Played himself into a real NBA contract. Watford averaged 7.6 points, 4.0 rebounds, 1.7 assists in 18.1 minutes. Shot 53% from the floor, including 23.7% from three and 75.5% from the free throw line. He appeared in just one of the Blazers' first 23 games and didn't see double-digit minutes until January 3rd. He was, very specifically, not part of the plan. A believable situation for a team, for a rookie, an undrafted rookie, on a two-way deal on a team that had a bunch of veterans in front of him in the front court. But once he was part of the plan, starting in January when the Blazers were had injuries and were beginning to, you know, a few, few weeks later, we're going to trade some guys away in front of Watford in the rotation. Watford was part of the plan, appearing in 29 straight games until March 28th when his season ended because of a bone bruise in his left leg. He took a tumble under the basket. It was really scary. Seemed like it was a lot worse. Turned out just to be a bone bruise. He was fine and ready to go when they played, started playing summer league in July. But Watford, from that January 3rd sort of insertion into the into the regular rotation and playing every single night as part of the plan for 30 straight games in that stretch from January 3rd until the All-Star break he earned himself some money he earned himself some stability and he changed his life from two-way player to standard NBA contract coming out of the All-Star break in the middle of February the Blazers converted Watford's two-way deal to a standard multi-year NBA contract. Uh, It includes a guarantee for this upcoming season and then two non-guaranteed years after that. He got a raise. He got some security and he got a chance to be a player. And then all he did was play like he really belongs. He closed his season with 13 straight games in double figures in scoring, including three consecutive games of 20 plus. He was really good. On a team that was really bad, Watford was absolutely one of the bright spots, and his injury at the end of the year made a team that was already pretty bad basically unwatchable. He was the reason that you turned on games at the end of the year because Watford was fun, exciting, and weird. Shooting floaters, running dribble handoffs, pushing off rebounds, all of the things that make Watford strange and unique made him really enjoyable. He was one of the truly, true bright spots of last season that was basically... I did the biggest dark cloud you could imagine. Watford, if you are looking for a silver lining to the Blazers season, Trenton Watford earning NBA money is absolutely it. The other guy, Drew Eubanks. Drew Eubanks was traded from the San Antonio Spurs to the Toronto Raptors just ahead of the trade deadline and then immediately waived by the Raptors on February 10th. He signed of what, what the first of what would be six 10 days with the Blazers on February 22nd. 
He was here temporarily, but forever. And in Portland, Drew Eubanks, the way that Watford wasn't part of the plan until he was, Drew Eubanks was part of the plan from day one. He appeared in 22 games for the Blazers. All starts, averaged 14.5 points, 8.5 boards, and 1.6 assists. Shot 64.6% from the floor, 26.7% from three, and 78.4% from the free throw line. Part of the plan. Like, for real, part of the plan from the moment he arrived. He never played fewer than 18 minutes in a game. He played He played 22 games, and he, played, he was a big minute producer in all of them. And his time in Portland included career nights, a 20-point and 12-rebound performance against Washington, and then a wild 27-point, 14 boards, 3 assists, 3 steals, and 2-block game against Oklahoma City. Only three times in Drew Eubanks' 22 appearances did he score in single digits. He was part of the plan, he was productive, and he was consistent. He also just played within himself, rarely trying to do more than he's capable of. He was mostly the sort of picture of when the Blazers, particularly late in the season when they were awful and they were just getting crushed and setting an NBA record for most losses by 30, game, by 30 points— 15. The previous NBA record had been 11. They shot past it. Uh, by my math, that's like a 30% increase in most 30-point blowouts. And Eubanks was part of that. And he was part of that on purpose. And the team was bad and bad around him, for sure. But Eubanks, productive, right? 14 and a half and 8 and a half. And also, he just did what he does. 76% of his shots came inside 10 feet. More than 70% of his shots were assisted. 60% of his shots came off, 64% of his shots came without a dribble. He got the ball, he went up with it. He didn't try to do anything crazy. In a, on a team where you had sort of carte blanche to go wild because the, the team was bad, Drew Eubanks just followed his script. Here's what I do best, I'm going to do it. And all that turned into was 14 and a half and nine, 14 and a half and eight and a half. And then an NBA contract. In July, Drew Eubanks signed a one-year minimum deal to return to the Blazers. The Shack of Troutdale, as he was named on this here podcast. The Pride of Reynolds High School Go Raiders. Shout out to my East County legends. Drew Eubanks, back on his hometown team, living out a real-life dream. How cool is that? Well, it's pretty darn cool. He's back. And what I want to talk about in the second segment is best and worst case scenarios for both Trent and Watford. And Drew Eubanks. We've talked about how they got here and what they did. Now we want to start looking ahead. What is the best Trent and Watford look like? What is the worst Trent and Watford look like? And the same for Drew Eubanks. That's what we'll do in the second segment. Before we get there, I want to tell you about Bet Online. It's the fastest and easiest way to bet on all your sports action. If you are looking to get in on some betting action for football, well, Guess what? You made it to college football and NFL fo- NFL season for the next three and a half, four months. You got more lines, more props, more odds than anywhere else on Bet Online. If you don't want to get in on the gridiron action, there's plenty of other things you can get in on, including NBA futures bets, including NHL futures bets, whatever it is, you're going to find action. So head on over to betonline.net today. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, let's talk best case and worst case scenarios. These are, we do these for every player on the team. Like I said, this is the sixth one of these we've done. These are players six and seven in our, in our we are halfway home as, as, as we finish up this episode. We are a third of the way through halfway home, so you do the math there. But when we do these best and worst case scenarios, we're doing them within reason. So based on your role on the, reasonable role on the team and how, you know, you'll interact with your coworkers and with your employer and without injuries. It's what you do on the court. And within reasonable expectations, we're not going to talk MVPs for folks who aren't going to win MVPs. So what is the best case scenario for Trent and Watford? Is that he continues to be a mismatch hunter who can take bigs off the dribble, who can bully smaller players in the post, who can grab and go off defensive rebounds and finish with either hand around the rim. The things that make him unique and strange continue to Make him unique and strange. The floater king, a man who is just so good with little push shots inside 15 feet, continues to be so darn good with push shots inside 15 feet. He grabs a rebound and goes end to end. He can Euro past anyone with his kind of sliding sidestep. He doesn't jump high, but he, he takes wide steps at a really high level. And he continues to be a, a smart passer, a smart playmaker with good touch. 
But the best case scenario was that all of that stays and, and he continues to sharpen what he's already good at. Those things that make him unique, as I said, continue to get better. But the real best case scenario is that he adds enough shooting to make himself an off-ball threat. And he becomes truly capable of playing power forward, either in small ball lineups where he's next to Grant and Winslow and we can debate about who's playing center and who's playing power forward. But more importantly, the best case scenario is that Trent Watford can play traditional power forward next to Yusuf Nurkic or next to Drew Eubanks or just in traditional looks. When the Blazers, when Jeremy Grant picks up an early second foul in the first quarter, you can look down and say, Trendon is a legit option. That's the best case scenario that he can play for. He needs to add off-ball skills to hit that best-case scenario. On the ball, Trenton Watford is a menace. He's really fun and exciting. Off the ball, and in a, a scenario where he's going to have to play off the ball more with a healthy Damian Lord and healthy Anthony Simons, that's where his lack of shooting comes up. And that's the worst-case scenario, is the shooting just never comes around. He was 9 of 38 from 3 last year in 48 games. Didn't shoot very many like passed up open threes relatively often and didn't make many under, you know, under, under a quarter of them, not just nine threes made in 48 games. And in a world where he doesn't shoot and he doesn't get as much on ball, on ball responsibility, that lack of off ball verve, off ball juice makes him a half court liability. He's more of a small ball five without much rim protection and a team needing a specific versatility. His skill set is not that specific versatility. He isn't your rim protector, wing defender, shooter that can complement the other parts. He is someone who has a specific set of skills. But Liam Neeson's specific set of skills, they aren't needed in this one. There's no hostage situation. Nobody got taken. They just need someone to play nine minutes of backup power forward in the third quarter. That's the worst case scenario. He ends up out, the worst case scenario for Trenton Watford is he ends up outside of the rotation on most nights as more of a curiosity than a solution to Portland's most common problems. Let's do Drew Eubanks. The best case scenario is he's the backup center because the efficient production we saw to end last season was no fluke. And that the Blazers' dreams of going small while still common and relatively regular throughout the season are not a nightly occurrence because Drew Eubanks is playing 15 minutes and those are too valuable to pass up. He develops as a passer, becomes a legit pick and roll threat with Portland's powerful guard tandem of Damian Lord and Anthony Simons and is a mainstay in the rotation because he deserves to be there. The Blazers want to go small. They have hinted at it overtly and subtly throughout the offseason anytime Joe Cronin or, or Chauncey Billups has spoken with the press. They've done it behind the scenes as well. They're, they are comfortable going small. But the best case for Drew, for Drew Eubanks is that he gets some time early in the season. And they say, he's too good, he, or, or does not training camp, he's too good to go small. We wanted to do this one thing, but we have to find minutes for Drew because he's our best option. The best case for Drew Eubanks is that he screws up a good plan. The worst case for Drew Eubanks is that he's just not the answer on a team with playoff aspirations and his lack of defensive impact, really low block numbers, really low steal numbers, and somewhat limited rebound ability. He's a slightly below average rebounder for the Blazers, although in years past he has graded out as a very good rebounder on other teams. But the worst case scenario is that those things hold and that on nights where Eubanks is asked to play a little bit, it becomes more of a problem, to the point where the Blazers are searching for other solutions, be it whoever wins the second two-way spot between Olivier Saar and Devontae Kaycock, or hunting for a solution on the free agent market, and the Blazers with an open roster spot are saying, we desperately need another center because Drew Eubanks isn't the answer. There are going to be nights when a second big is a necessity, and the worst-case scenario is that necessity breeds invention. It doesn't just give you Drew Eubanks. It makes you get creative because Drew Eubanks is not the answer. Those are the polls. So we try to do in the best case and worst case scenarios is we set the polls and then everybody lands in the middle. That's what I'm trying to do here is, is find the edges and then we close the show searching for a middle. What is a realistic role and realistic expectations for Watford and Eubanks? Let's talk about it to close the show. Join me in the third segment, won't you? Still a pass first point guard. I'm still Mike Richmond. You are still listening to Locked on Blazers. 
What we do in the middle segment of these player capsules, player previews, is we kind of set what I think is reasonable highest expectations and reasonable lowest expectations. The whole point is that everyone lands in the middle. Some guys' pendulum swings worse, some guys' pendulum swings best. Some folks, is it's so darn narrow that the best and worst is hard to tell. But I think with these guys, it's easier to kind of see where they might land. I think Trendon Watford is a rotation player on night one. I think he's a backup big on night one. Uh, Portland has like a a pretty set in stone top seven. Damian Lord, Anthony Simons, Nazir Little, Jeremy Grant, Yusuf Nurkic, Josh Hart, and Gary Payton II are going to play on night one. That seven is in the books. Justin Winslow is pretty likely to play on night one. I think I think that's fair. He's pretty 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 darn likely to play on night one. Just veteran who can help on all of those things. That's eight. Who plays the ninth? Who's who is the ninth guy? Is 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 a question. And if Chauncey Billups, who didn't often go ten, but sometimes did last year, go ten. If he does go ten, then there's two spots that are probably up for grabs. I think Watford right now is your ninth man. I think today, as we sit here in in the late September, second second week of September, is that not Watford is 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 your is your ninth guy to begin the season. I think he plays. And because of that, I do not think Drew Eubanks plays early in the season. I think he's more of an emergency third center type role. Because Portland has expressly said they want to go small. Like I mentioned, Jeremy Grant and Justice Winslow are going to get chances to play center because the Blazers think our wing core is better than it's ever been and we want to get Josh Hart and Gary Payton and Jeremy Grant and Justice Winslow on the floor and have the real defensive versatility like we haven't had to be able to switch one through five, be able to play super fast with with the backup unit and just blitz people and, and, and our strangeness will be the thing that dictates the mismatches. And I think because of that... Watford is probably a more likely choice. Um, he's not, he wasn't a very good defensive player in year one. Rookies are typically bad on defense. Um, it's the steps he takes in year two that will be much more important than his production in year one on that side of the floor. But in terms of the versatility, the playing like switchable defenses and all of those things, Watford seems to check that box. And quite frankly, Trenton Watford was went into Summer League needing to be the Blazers' best player and came out of Summer League as very clearly the best player on the Blazers' Summer League roster. He earned it. He earned it in, he earned it in February. He earned it in March. He's earned, he earned it again in July. Watford's going to play in, I believe, I'm guessing here, this is what I do, is I'm giving you a prediction. He's going to play early in the season. He's your ninth man. He's part of the rotation to begin the year. I think that... The backup center, backup big man conversation, the fact that it includes these two gentlemen, can be read in one of two ways. The first way is that the Blazers learned enough during the tankathon when they were kind of just, you know, getting everyone out of the way that was part of the plan for the future, for sure, Winslow and Hart and Ant and 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 Nurk, and getting young guys and 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 temporary players out there and and Ben McLemore who just had to had to play during an epic epic tankathon where they lost 21 of their final 23 games on purpose and they lost by 30 points you know 15 times they got crushed they got smoked and they and they did they pursued those losses to 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 some extent but the generous read is that during that stretch of data collection and loss collection the the team learned enough about Watford and Eubanks to say those dudes got it they can play and we're going to go into next season with cheap useful options in the back half of the rotation because we know we're going to be expensive with Nurk and, and Ant and Dame we're and you know potentially Jeremy Grant because it seems like they knew they were getting Jeremy Grant for a long time like that data collection allowed them to say whether it's Watford or Eubanks we're comfortable in those backup big minutes that's that's the generous read. And I think there's something to that, right? Like they did see it and watch it and like that's certainly there's some truth there. The other read is that Portland's front court is so wildly thin that the fact that I'm doing this specific episode talking about Trent and Watford and Drew Eubanks is just the sign of a glaring roster flaw that is going to show up and eventually be a problem for the Blazers.
That is the less generous read. You talk about best case and worst case scenarios. I think they learned that Drew Eubanks, and I, and I think we saw this, just, you know, we, no numbers. Like, he's pretty obviously an NBA player. So the Blazers paid him like one, gave him a minimum contract. And uh, Trenton Watford is pretty obviously an NBA player. So they paid him like one, and gave him a minimum contract. Two minimum guys at the end of the bench are not going to change the drastically outcome in, to the negative for the Blazers, right? Like if Watford and, and Eubanks can't play, it's not, if, if they're not like high-level contributors, it's fine, right? Like the, 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 if that's what sinks this team, the, the roster was flawed to begin with. But the fact that these dudes are options and Watford is almost certainly your ninth man or, or very likely your ninth man in opening night speaks to kind of what the roster situation is. I think Trenton Watford's going to play 60-ish games and average like 12 minutes a night. Like, that's my role, realistic role for Watford. It's that he's a pretty regular part of the plan. Maybe not all, every night because it's like you might be choosing between Justice Winslow and Trenton Watford, and Winslow's just a better defender. And maybe that checks more boxes more often than what, uh, than what Watford brings. I think Drew Eubanks' realistic role, like I mentioned, is like that he's not part of the plan and he plays something like 38 games. Uh, and then when he plays, he might play bigger minutes because it'll be like, hey, Nurk's out. We need you to, you know, we need you to play 29 minutes tonight or whatever it might be. But I don't think any, either of these guys are big minute contributors. I don't think either of these guys are going to be relied on to take massive steps forward. If they do, they are incredible floor raisers. If Trenton Watford improves as much as this season as he did from like October to January last year when he was like a dude who just didn't look like he belonged to, oh, this guy could play. He's good. He could play. If he takes that type of leap in year two, the Blazers floor gets a lot higher pretty quickly. If Drew Eubanks, the, you know, he's not going to average 14 and a half and eight and a half or whatever, 15 and nine, because he's not going to play that much. But if that, you know, a guy who shoots 65% from the floor on only shots he can make and, and you know, is a, is a really high-level finisher, shoots like something in the, according to Clean the Glass, the 85th percentile among bigs in effective field goal percentage, he was efficient and consistent. If he's that when he plays, the floor gets raised a bunch. The Blazers get better if these two gentlemen take steps forward. If they don't, if they hit their worst case scenarios, and I think probably both of these guys trend more towards like the, the pendulum leans a little more towards worst case scenario, then it's not that big of a deal. Why I say that, and let me be clear, is that I think that Watford was really good, but he got the ball in his hands so much in a way that he's not going to get the ball in his hands so much with Dame and Ant and Josh Hart and Jeremy Grant and Nurk all healthy. He's just not the role he's going to have. He's got to add something else to his game. And so I think it, he just, you know, he just tends towards his worst case scenario. Like the pendulum is, is whatever, 42%. Uh, it's, it's on that half. And, and Eubanks just like, the team has kind of said that they don't want to play two traditional bigs. And so just by virtue of like, if Eubanks is in the game, the plan went a little bit south. Obviously the best case scenario is that Eubanks himself subverts the plan. But I think again, like it kind of, leans that way where he's like more third center than backup center and that there are nights when that gets exposed these two guys are fun quite frankly like Trent Watford was like I said like my favorite part of last season and and Drew Eubanks is a, a story that is easy to root for what you hope is that these two gentlemen help raise the floor in their roles that they will be asked to play back up big in different capacities if they don't raise the floor I don't think the bottom falls out but you got to hope that what they do complements what the Blazers need. And I think that's the challenge for everyone who plays a role in the NBA. Does what, does the, the question, is the question you answer, is it even being asked? And I worry that for both of these gentlemen, it's not always. And I think that's where I land with two guys that I, I enjoy and will root for, but I'm not sure that they're massively impactful players in their second seasons with the team. That's going to do it for today's show. Why don't you come back and join me for Friday's show? We'll talk more player previews. And then we're back. Training or uh, Media Day is on Monday, the 26th, and we are rolling after that. And we will five days a week. And this show's back to a daily podcast. Tell your friends about the show. Uh, this is a good place to start. Uh, we've done now, we've previewed now seven players if you made it to the end of this episode. That's half the roster. Uh, Great. If you are new to the podcast, 
listen to these capsules and kind of get a sense of what I think the team is going to be, then you can email me and tell me I'm wrong at lockdownblazerspot at gmail.com. Good jumping off point for new listeners. If you are a new listener, I'm so happy to have you. Thank you for listening. If you're a longtime listener, I'm really happy to have you still on board. We are just getting rolling. The season is almost here. I'm super excited. I hope you are too. Do me a favor. If this was your first listen, how about make your second listen? The NBA's top 50. Uh, Lockdown NBA feed, wherever you get podcasts or on YouTube, you'll find it there. We're counting down the 50 best players in the NBA as 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 set by the odds makers at Bet Online. It's who are the most impactful needle movers in the league. We got a top 50 countdown. Find it in your Lockdown NBA feed. Like I said, wherever you get podcasts are also on YouTube. Appreciate you listening. I'll talk to you soon.